Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. And he sustains all things by his powerful word. Please join me in prayer. We would make room for you this night of all nights, dear Lord. Room in our minds and hearts. Room also in our life together. Let your word be born in us anew so that, by the power of the Holy Spirit, your splendor shines in us and through us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we come together this evening, we are in a liminal space. We're leaving Advent, and we're barely entering into Christmas time. As we begin our service this evening, let us reflect on where we've been by lighting again the first four candles of the Advent wreath. We light the first candle to remind us of the people's hope for the promised Messiah. We light the second candle to remind us of the wonder of God's angels' good news. We light the third candle to remind us of the shepherds' joy as they came to see Jesus. We light the fourth candle to remind us of the peace proclaimed by the angels who announced the birth of the Savior of the world, the child Jesus.
Hear these words from the prophet Isaiah, the 52nd chapter, verses 7 through 9. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your sentinels lift up their voices together. They sing for joy. For in plain sight they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together in singing, you ruins of Jerusalem. For the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Now we hear the Christmas story as told by the writer of the Gospel of Luke. Luke chapter 1, verses 26 through 38. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin engaged to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and he came to her and said, Greetings, favored one. The Lord is with you. But she was much perplexed by his words and pondered what sort of greeting this might be. The angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son, 
and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give to him the throne of his ancestor David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I am a virgin? And the angel said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And therefore the child to be born will be holy. He will be called Son of God. And now your relative Elizabeth in her old age has also conceived a son, and this is the sixth month for her who was said to be barren. For nothing will be impossible with God. Then Mary said, Here am I, the servant of the Lord. Let it be with me according to your word. Then the angel departed from her. continues his narration of the birth story in the second chapter. Let us hear now verses 1 through 7. In those days a decree went out from Emperor Augustus that all the world should be registered. And this was the first registration and was taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. All went to their own towns to be registered. Joseph also went from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to the city of David called Bethlehem, because he was descended from the house and family of David. He went to be registered with Mary, to whom he was engaged, and who was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for her to deliver her child, and she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn.
tell us the story. Luke 2, verses 8 through 20. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. And when they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, as it had been told them. Christ the infant brought joy, but Christ the Savior brought even more. In the glow of the Christ candle, we see the hands which he stretches out in love. We remember the salvation he bought for us on Calvary. We rejoice that he is the light of the world, as the aged Simeon sang when Mary and Joseph brought the baby Jesus to the temple. God sent his son into a sinful world to save mankind. Let us try to show his love in our lives. The Advent light shines on. May the Christ candle shine in our hearts now, this Christmas season and throughout the year. Let us light the Christ candle, which symbolizes the birth of Christ. And let us remember that Jesus came as God's gift of love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have everlasting life.
about you, but I've always wondered how Mary felt after Gabriel left her. She certainly had a mountaintop moment. She certainly sang God's praises in the speech that we find in Luke that we know now as the Magnificat. She certainly was happy, but as the months dragged on, I wonder how she felt. I wonder if at some point the scandal of being pregnant while not married became too much to bear. We don't know how her immediate family reacted to the news. We don't know what happened to her before she went to see her kinswoman, Elizabeth. I suspect there were times when as exciting as the news had been, she felt isolated and alone. And certainly there are those tonight in our church family who cannot be with those they love, who also feel isolated and alone. Not only because of the pandemic, but because of other life circumstances that have come into play in many lives in the St. Paul's family. Well, this may seem like a shocking redirection of this sermon, but I want to tell you what I've been doing during the pandemic. We have at our house felt a little bit isolated, but have been very fortunate to stay in contact with our family members and friends. But one of the things that we've done a lot of is binge watch TV. And I have to admit that one of the programs I've really enjoyed watching lately is an old 1960s comedy called My Favorite Martian. You may remember it if you're of a certain age. It was Ray Walston as Uncle Martin the Martian and Bill Bixby as his fictional, because they were putting on uh, a false identity, his fictional nephew who had a number of adventures after this Martian crash landed on Earth and Bill Bixby's character, Tim O'Hara, found him and brought him into his house to live. And as they would say in Hollywood comedies, hijinks ensued for at least 75 more episodes. I enjoyed this show as a child because in my mind it was fun to fantasize in a positive way what it would be like to be visited by people from another planet. Now, there's certainly a lot of other portrayals of what would happen if they came to Earth. H.G. Wells' War of the Worlds is certainly a famous one, but I preferred the ones that were a little more lighthearted and positive. And if you're of a little younger age, maybe you remember Mork and Mindy, the Mork from, Mork from Ork, and have a similar feeling. I mentioned this tonight isolation on one hand and visitation on the other because I want to remind us this evening that we live on a visited planet. Perhaps not by Uncle Martin and his friends from Mars or Mork's friends from Ork, but we have been visited by the creator of the world who has walked on this firmament just as we do. Jesus Christ came to earth because God sent him to do what God has done from the beginning of human history, and that is worked toward reconciling the people he has created back to himself. What do I mean by that? Well, I think we would all agree that all of mankind, all of humankind, I should say, has and continues to fall short of the ideal of what God would want us to be. Now to be sure, there are a lot of people in the world that don't give this a second thought, but as Christians, we are called to be mindful of that fact. We fall short, but we worship a God who does not give up on us. He is not easily discouraged. In fact, ours is a God who comes and seeks us out to call us back to him. And the event we celebrate this evening on this Christmas Eve is the coming into the world to do, of, of Jesus to do exactly that, to call us back to God, to show us the way home, to show us how God is 
and to show us how to be in response. Friends, while we traditionally have a very strong turnout for Christmas Eve services, I'm here to tell you this evening that Christmas is not the holiest day of the year. But Christmas is important in the church year because we celebrate a beginning. Or as Winston Churchill once said in 1942, I'll paraphrase here, now is not the end. It's not even the beginning of the end, but perhaps it is the end of the beginning. And I think that quote is appropriate for us to consider tonight because Christ coming into the world even 2,000 years ago is just one more step of God's work to save his people. And what we are called to do in response tonight to the coming of Christ into the world is a first step and what we will continue to do as we walk together as servants of God, helping God do what God will do, either through us or in spite of us. The choice of how to respond is ours. God has come to us. Will we receive him? Will we abide with him? Will we follow him? Will we bet our lives on him? Amen. Christmas story from the first chapter of John, the first five verses. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. 
the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not over. <laughs>